so welcome to the first class week one on uh, fluid mechanics uh, just as a start uh, i'll be teaching first two months of the course and then uh, prasad will uh, take over uh, and i want to start by telling you that fluid mechanics is an extremely active uh, area of research for not only engineering but also science and technology of the future and how is that so i shall uh, tell you as we go along uh, in today's class but uh, with a bit of history um, fluid mechanics is an old subject um, the first navier stokes equation there were two gentlemen mr navier and stokes and they wrote down the Newton's equation uh, as applied or as adapted for the fluid mechanics sometime between 1820 and 1850. So one person was uh, had made some contribution, then the other person came along. And uh, at the end of, by 19, 1850, we knew how the Navier-Stokes equation, which is Newton's equation as adapted for fluids uh, whose uh, shape and, vol uh, and volume can change, uh, how that can be written. And that's called the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, the Navier-Stokes equation is nothing but a momentum conservation equation, the Newton's equation for a fluid. But uh, even much before uh, Navier-Stokes, uh, Isaac Newton, who was born in 1643, died in uh, 1727, Wikipedia information. Uh, so basically, he was playing around with uh, fluids. And what he observed with the water and other simple fluids that when you apply a stress to it, a shear stress to it, uh, then you basically, the fluid starts to flow and you can measure something called the strain rate. And what is that? We'll soon come to it. And the stress and the strain rate for a fluid was related uh, by a quantity, a constant quantity, a property of the fluid called the viscosity. The note that the stress varies linearly with the strain rate and liquids and fluids which behave, which have a linear relation between stress and strain rate are called uh, Newtonian fluids. On the other hand, one also has a, uh, a topic of study of today are non-Newtonian fluids where the viscosity itself is a function of the strain rate. Uh, and uh, the stress thereby fol uh, follows a nonlinear uh, relation with the strain rate, and those are not Newtonian, uh, non-Newtonian fluids. But most of this course will be dealing with Newtonian fluids, right? Uh, so, I mean, people have been stu studying fluids, even in terms of equations, quite some time back. And uh, a an, uh, small quip before we start the course. Uh, I mean, ta start talking science. Uh, Heisenberg, who, whom you all know, uh, has this immense contribution to quantum mechanics, and he also got the 1932 Nobel Prize for it. He, he was given um, for his PhD uh, a problem to study turbulent flows and have a better understanding of turbulence. Uh, his thesis advisor was Arnold Sommerfeld. But uh, I guess what happened, I don't know. Maybe it was too difficult. So he decided to go into quantum mechanics. And as you, as they say, the rest is history. So turbulence is still not a solved problem. And in 1995, Uriel Fresh, a French scientist, um, he has written a book on turbulence uh, after decades of research. Uh, and uh, he's still alive. He's still working on turbulence. Turbulence is not a solved problem as of yet. Uh, uh, so there are many people trying to understand a better understanding of uh, the turbulent flow phenomena. Right. So it's an open problem. Uh, but uh, what is a fluid? What is a? Uh, let's discuss. I mean, you all have an idea about water and air being a fluid. But what is the definition of a fluid? Um, so I shall start with the definition of a Newtonian fluid uh, and compare a solid and how the fluid properties are different. So if you had a solid, suppose this block of mass um, given by the solid line uh, between two surfaces and basically you sheared the solid, you applied a force per unit area on the top surface. Um, and then on application of the force, the, 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 the solid material would deform and take 
uh, such a shape, say, right? And as long as you keep applying the force and assuming the force is not very high, there would be a constant deformation in the uh, substance, in the solid substance. And when you remove effects, if you remove the force, the the solid will come back to its original shape. I mean, that's for simple solids. Of course, you can have other types of solids, uh, but we're talking of simple uh, solids, who came solids, if you like. And then you can define something called the strain, which is dx, this deformation, by this distance, L, L the surface between the two. So that would be strain. And for a solid, the stress, sigma xy, would be the shear modulus into the strain. On the other hand, if you have a fluid between two surfaces um, and uh, you keep the bottom surface fixed and the top surface, you apply a force, then the liquid is going to stick uh, to the top surface and it will start to flow, which means it will attain a constant velocity. The top surface, if you keep applying the force, it will attain a constant velocity. Uh, but you will have a velocity gradient because this surface is not moving. The liquid is going to stick to the this surface and you will have a velocity gradient. So as long as the force is there, the fluid will keep on moving. Right? The, the displacement will keep on increasing. Here the displacement was finite. Here the displacement will keep on increasing. And on the top surface, you would have the displacement to be V0 into dt in a small time t and of course if you increase dt the displacement will be more and for the fluid what you can measure or you, what you can define is something called a strain rate this was strain and this is strain rate and in this case it's the displacement and displacement itself is dependent upon time more displacement uh, as uh, as you go on with time assuming the force is held constant and then a strain rate is dx by L by dt. So strain rate has a dimension of 1 by tau, right? And what is dx? It's v0 into dt. Uh, I mean, if there's more time, then this displacement will be more. And for a fluid, or more accurately, a Newtonian fluid, the stress, the sigma xy, uh, x being this direction and y being this direction, right, will be proportional to uh, viscosity, uh, uh, sorry, the sigma x file will be proportional to the strain rate. So here sigma was proportional to strain and here uh, sigma x y is proportional to strain rate, the proportionality constant B viscosity, which is independent of gamma dot for a, for a Newtonian fluid. So there's a lot of work uh, going on. Uh, and uh, just to tell you the most important journals of fluid mechanics, uh, one there is one called, this is an extremely prestigious journal, Journal of Fluid Mechanics, JFM, uh, which is uh, published by Cambridge University, it has been around since 1956. Uh, the fluid mechanics has become so important that there's a separate APS, American Physical Society journal, which has started physical review of fluids as recent as 2016. Previously, physical uh, fluid mechanics problems were also being published in Physical Review E, uh, which is again an American Physical Society journal and Physics of Fluids, which is American Institute of Physics. And this has been around since 1958 and then uh, there are many many journals uh, but some of the more important ones are also annual reviews of fluid mechanics journal of non-newtonian rheology all sorts of astrophysics and astronomy journals uh, publish uh, of course fluid mechanics work because astronomy and astrophysics is um, I mean, it's gas flow, right? Extremely dilute gas flow, charged gas flow in magnetohydrodynamics, in magnetic fields, electric fields at high temperatures, at high uh, densities and non-high densities at high temperatures and so on and so forth. Soft matter journals publish fluid mechanics and also journal of uh, chemical uh, physics. Uh, but these typically focus more on non-Newtonian rheology, microfluidics and so on and so forth, nanofluidics and so on and so forth, right? Um, okay, so there are so many journals, and uh, where do you, uh, who, who all study fluid mechanics? Uh, if you study fluid mechanics, what kind of 
areas of science and technology can you contribute uh, to how where can you find jobs of course engineering subjects uh, like mechanical chemical uh, uh, engineering um, and civil of course study fluid mechanics they have multiple courses on uh, fluid mechanics mechanical having basically uh, turbines and gas turbines and hydro turbines and so on and so forth chemical various kinds of chemical mixtures flow of um, petrol of whatever fluids through pipes mixing problems and so on and so forth civil of course that's important you make a tall building burj al khalifa and you want to know uh, under wind what will be the wind profile, uh, wind flow profile around it? Aerospace engineering, I don't need to tell about why aerospace engineering uh, needs to study fluid mechanics. Marine, naval, of course, for dams, hydroelectric projects, all of this needs uh, uh, fluid mechanics. But you are not uh, engineering students. In physics or other branches of science, where is fluid mechanics used? Of course, astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, outer space has uh, gaseous inter interstellar matter, extremely dilute gases. And when one of these, some of these gases collapse, they can form galaxies at large length scales and stars at smaller length scales. Of course, solar physics needs fluid mechanics. The sun is not, nothing but extremely hot plasma charged particles um, you know, flowing around um, uh, in the presence of nuclear uh, reactions which are the energy sources and also a high electric and magnetic fields right so uh, fluid mechanics is an extremely important component of astronomy and astrophysics uh, furthermore fluid mechanics is also relevant for earth science for climate and weather prediction typhoons uh, study of ocean currents, glaciers. Glaciers is looked at as a viscoelastic fluid. Volcano ma and magma flow, earthquakes and tectonic shifts. So uh, if you can see that the surface of the earth is fluid-like, they're not exactly fluid. You have to add to much uh, more than you know, Newtonian fluid mechanics. But these are places where you have to have a basic idea of fluid mechanics and more to for uh, to study a class of problems aerospace and defense again uh, as soon as i say uh, the picture of drones missiles isro rockets uh, they need uh, of course aerospace um, engineers fighter jets and other unmentionable weapons so by this i mean chemical weapons they need to know at what rate um, uh, chemicals will mix and so on and so forth uh, it's terrible but that's how life is. Uh, fluid mechanics for biomechanics. If you want to know uh, why a shark is able to move so fast or how the dolphin uh, creates thirst, uh, its thrust to flow, to jump out of water. How are their uh, body shapes suitably tuned? How and why do they, how much thrust do they require and so on and so forth, right? And similarly, if you want to know about bird flights, uh, why can falcon uh, dive so fast? And uh, why can the owl, uh, while it flies, hardly makes any sound, whereas the pigeon makes extremely noisy flights, right? Some birds are able to glide and uh, glide and uh, basically fly over an entire day without getting tired. For that, they need energy efficient ways of flying right how is the insect able to fly, uh, fly with such fast uh, flapping of its wings on butterflies and moths and of course while uh, studying them is in of interest by itself of course that also helps you to figure out to make tiny drones which can be spyware uh, like an insect which can uh, sit quietly on the wall and so on and so forth, right? So you study insects just for the interest of it, why uh, insect, butterflies, moths, uh, hummingbirds, and each has their different flow patterns. And owl is apparently one of the birds which can fly with the least amount of noise. And you know, different birds fly in different ways, uh, right? So, so biomechanics and biomimetics, uh, you need fluid mechanics for biomedical science, flow of blood. Blood is an Newtonian uh, fluid, and you want to study 
how the blood flows through the heart or outside the arteries when you're going to get heart attacks and so on and so forth. Uh, blood flow through the heart or through the arteries or through thinner arteries, microfluidics. It's different from blood flow in the lungs where there are large surface areas so to allow oxygen exchange. And of course, iron flow, iron flow in neurons needs, uh, well, el electrokinetic flows and so on and so forth. Right, of course, fluid mechanics is important in soft and active matter. Typically, we use low Reynolds number fluid mechanics to study uh, molecular transport and in biological physics, especially intra and intercellular flows within the cell and outside the cell, especially in development biology. So basically, there are flows which are induced within the cell, which uh, in turn create stress, strain, and uh, shape the cell or the tissue. Uh, Non-Newtonian flows, microfluidics, nanofluidics used for CPU design. After all, the metal has to flow onto the right place in a controlled manner on the motherboard to fire design faster CPUs. Uh, future drug designing, 3D printing, all of this science and technology is using fluid mechanics. It's used heavily in sports and sports garment. Reducing drag in sprints, cycling, swimming, how to de design better motor cars, right? And also, of course, to better design cricket balls if they want you ball, want the ball to see more and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, the bowler doesn't need it, but the person who is designing balls, are, you know about sports uh, science, is, has developed into a major thing in many places. Flow through ultra high vacuum uh, in space or in atomic and molecular labs of say Umakant, who uses extremely high vacuum. He has to pump the air out to get his Bose Einstein uh, condensate at very low temperatures as well as LIGO labs. Right? Flow through porous media. You need to understand uh, how much soil, soil is going to, uh, water is going to seep into the soil. Uh, so that's a porous media, the rocks and soil of different nature, petrol extraction through rocks and skin. When you apply an appoint, uh, ointment, you need to know how much ointment uh, the uh, thing will be absorbed and also cosmetic products, right? So there's a very wide range of examples, which I hope some of which you had not thought of where fluid mechanics is used. Uh, of course, household products like ketchup and so on. So that's all non-Newtonian fluids. Okay. So with that background, um, what is fluid mechanics? I mean, I defined previously what is a fluid, but now I'm saying uh, what the study of fluid mechanics entail. Of course, measurement of fluid velocities in 3D space. But in this course, we'll be mainly focusing, this being a theoretical classroom course, we'll be focusing on basically the solution of three partial differential equations under various conditions, simplifying conditions. So the three equations, the three partial differential equations are the mass conservation equation, the momentum conservation equation, and the energy equation. So this mass conservation equation is something like del rho del t, rho being the density of a fluid. Now suppose you have some control volume. And suppose there's a flux of matter uh, through the surface. Some mass is flowing out or some other mass is uh, flowing in from some other uh, on the, uh, from some other part of the surface. So the flux, the divergence of the flux goes as del rho de del t, right? That's the mass conservation equation. And similarly, you have the momentum conservation equation. Suppose you have a surface which is encompassing the some volume, right? Then by Gauss's law, which you have studied in your mathematical physics course, then basically the flux can be, uh, the divergence of the flux of momentum can be related to del, del T of the local momentum within the volume. And similarly for energy conservation, right? You will have a del E del T and that will be, basically equal to divergence of the energy current. 
right? And when you write down these equations, uh, these fluxes and currents and uh, will be written in terms of density, the viscosity, especially in the momentum conservation equation, energy conservation equation. Uh, if there are surface tension gradients, that will contribute. If there is uh, basically two different fluids of different thermal conductivity, uh, so thermal conductivity um, creates local, if you are heating it, then basically it will create a temperature gradient due to which there can be convection. You can have flows of compressible fluids or incompressible fluids. And then, of course, heat capacities if because if you're heating it. Right? Uh, different regions can absorb, different fluids can absorb different amounts of heat and set up temperature gradients and so on and so forth. You can have CP and CV. In general, I have written in, uh, in terms of C. You have also thermal diffusivity which is nothing but conductivity, thermal conductivity K by rho and C, heat capacity, right? And the problem of fluid mechanics is given a certain force distribution as a function of X, Y, Z, or at certain points, or if boundary conditions are given. So you have, if, you, uh, if you give force distribution to the fluid and supply it with suitable constitutive equations, uh, constitutive equations basically uh, stress, how does it depend upon uh, the strain rate, right? Or uh, so that's the force, uh, that's a constitutive equation for Newtonian fluids, and you can have similar other ones for non Newtonian fluids. Fixed law, how does the um, mass current or diffusion current depend upon the concentration gradient? And Fourier's law, which says the energy current, which is uh, how much is the energy flux? How is it dependent upon the temperature gradient, right? So, so you, you have the momentum, you have these three equations. And if you know the force distribution, have the constitutive equations, and given suitable boundary conditions, depending upon what you specify, uh, you can find out quantities like velocity as a function of space and time, density as a function of space of time, is then if density is varying, temperature grade uh, as a function of space and time, if suppose there's convective flows and mass is flowing from one region to the other, how does the temperature change? Stress gradients and pressure gradients. So it depends, so some of it you can specify, some of it you can control and you measure the other, or you calculate the other quantities. Uh, if you already know your flow fields, you might be calculating T of R. On the other hand, if you are controlling uh, T of R at the boundaries, you might be interested in knowing the flow fields and so on and so forth, right? So these are the quantities that we, we specify some of the things, we control some of the con uh, conditions in experiments and measure some other quantities or calculate some other quantities using these equations and so on and so forth. So that's what it is. And we will be discussing simple flow, uh, flows and there are also multiple uh, multi-phase flows. What is multi-phase flow? Suppose you have a bottle of Coca-Cola and there are bubbles uh, fluid which is flowing through uh, the background soda water or whatever coca-cola water it's multi-phase flows but we are not discussing that right uh just going a bit in a bit more gory detail so that was the overview in words but the basically the mass conservation equation can be written like this uh del rho del t rho being the density and of course, uh, in this equation, you're considering it for a compressible fluid so that the density can change, uh, is changing as a function of time and space. But often we study incompressible fluids. But anyway, this is the mass conservation equation. And this is related to the divergence of the mass current. Rho into V is the mass current. And you, to make sense of it, of course, you have to use the integral form, right? So you basically uh, consider a control volume and you just measure how much flux of this mass current is passing out to the, con uh, to the surfaces which encompass the control volume and that is related to the local density change as a function of time.
these are of course v is there so there's a time also here right and a very similar idea for the moment of conservation equation del del t of rho the local density into velocity mass into velocity mass into velocity but per unit volume so rho into v and that is related to the divergence plus uh, divergence of the momentum flux this is the momentum flux so momentum is rho into v and it can flow out in different directions uh, right so that's why v v and this is a tensor it could be considered as so this is basically a three cross three matrix a three cross three tensor v i v j i can run from x y z j can run from x y z uh, so you have nine components not all nine components need to be independent but whatever right so uh, so that's what it is this is the pressure and this is the again the you know the unity matrix and this is the stress tensor for the fluid inside which uh, you will have all the viscous terms and so on and so forth right and there can be many other terms and uh, so this is basically basically whatever is the so this is the rate of change this is a divergence which will finally so this is the momentum flux term right uh, which you can write in terms of gauss's law and that is proportional to uh, external forcing rho into g g can be the suppose the gravitational field right or this is basically the external force term and uh, and here you have the energy flux, uh, energy conservation equation, which says del, del T of the energy density, which consists of the internal energy density, the kinetic energy density, right? And that is equal to divergence of J, energy current, energy flux, right? Uh, into the stress tensor dot V. Now, remember the stress tensor, Ah, sorry, this is the external ex external driving. So it's like the gravitation field, if you like. Right. And uh, gravitational field force uh, into rho. In, uh, if, uh, G into rho will have dimensions of suppose F. And into dx dt. Into dx would be energy, and this is saying how much energy is changing as a function of time. The energy flux equation, energy current density, if you like, right, uh, will have uh, terms like this rho into v, velocity, how much is it changing, and the internal, internal energy, potential energy, if you like, pressure by rho, kinetic energy density then uh, then this is the stress this is the stress again force per unit area into dx dt so how much energy is changing because force into uh, dx gives energy right by dt rate of change so so the rate of change per unit time is being calculated and this is the heat flux right uh, heat flux will be kappa conductivity into the temperature gradient so this is all that is there and all that we have to do is solve these equations of course there are added complications like the fluid it can be compressible and fluid elements the element of the fluid itself can change its shape as it flows right so the boundary conditions we even if you consider a fluid element it can change its shape and boundaries as it flows as it uh, faces uh, different forces or yeah so solving this cup, this partial differential equation, set of three partial differential equations within which there are so many terms uh, can get pretty difficult. That's hardly um, surprising, right? And uh, there are more terms. And if you have non-Newtonian fluids, it's much more complicated than this. And uh, right? Uh, so what we do is basically try, I mean, we can solve it, these three equations, three coupled equations in all its glory, the mass, momentum, and energy. But uh, even if you manage to do it, uh, either computationally or even mathematically, uh, you don't often get a full understanding of what is happening because the 
is there too many nonlinear coupled uh, equations, right? Uh, by the way, uh, theoretical uh, fluid mechanics is often studied in the applied mathematical maths department uh, around in the world, not maybe so much in India, but uh, definitely in the world. Uh, it's it's basically a study of partial differential equations also, right? So applied maths, people study it. And the point is, even if you manage to solve it exactly with all these gory details of boundary conditions and so on and so forth, the most three general equations, uh, it's so complicated, you don't often have an understanding of it. And uh, just to give an example, uh, I mean, those who have done computational physics in the last semester, they did the Turing problem, uh, which was a set of uh, two coupled uh, diffusion equations, right? And even that was quite difficult. Here you have three with much more complexity. There it was simple, but even there it was difficult to understand. And what we did is throw out some terms, get an understanding of what is happening, and then add a term, and then get an understanding of what is happening, and so on and so forth. And that is exactly uh, the approach we are going to take for this course, where we're going to simplify uh, various boundary conditions say that, okay, we are going to study uh, incompressible fluids as an example, and then you'll see that the energy equation one and two decouples from the energy equation, sorry, uh, the mass equation and the momentum equation decouples from the energy equation. So you have the set of two different, just two equations. And then we say, okay, uh, uh, why don't we uh, look at an Eulerian fluid where we are neglecting the effects of viscosity and what, how would such a fluid flow? And one can have good examples of um, Eulerian fluid in nature. And then what would be the flow lines like or how would it behave? Suppose we ignore temperature gradients, we ignore uh, convection and so on and so forth. How would the flows be? So having understood that, we'll add some more complication and say, okay, let's now see how the fluid flows across a more slightly more complex uh, boundary condition. And then we'll say, okay, now if we study composable flow, um, what are the simplifying assumptions we can make and so on and so forth. So this is going to be the uh, approach, right? So, so the rest of the course will be taking various simple cases and try to get an understanding of fluid flow, heat flow, and so on and so forth, convection flow, and so on and so forth. Uh, one thing I would like you to note that when you, as, as I said, for incompressible fluids, uh, or even if you have compressible fluids, uh, basically, this is the equation, and there is no temperature in this equation. So how would one study convection flows? So basically what would happen is you have to write the density, uh, use the equation of state to figure out how density changes as a function of temperature and plug that in and then solve the fluid flow and convection flow. So what I want to impress upon you that there are a lot of nuance, nuances in uh, fluid mechanics uh, in these hidden in these three equations. And that is what we're going to study simple cases one by one over the next four months, right? Uh, when the fluid is incompressible, you know, which means the incompressible limit, this equation can be simplified. So this divergence, these derivatives, when they act on rho, Right, you consider them those contributions to be zero in the incompressible limit because you assume density is uniform as a function of space and time, and then it uh, it basically this equations looks like this: rho f into dv dt, rho f v dot grad v. You might have seen such an expression, um, right? Minus grad p, the gradient of pressure can drive the flow. Uh, viscous terms eta into grad square v. So this is basically from here you get this equation. From here you get this this term, not equation. This term, external field uh, is here, right? And often people work with this equation rather than this one, 
this simplifies here you are throwing away all derivatives on rho with uniform weight density right you couple with uh, also with the yeah so we'll discuss things in more detail right so there are quite a few nuances in this uh, I already told that uh, to have uh, convection, one has to incorporate density variation in the compressible Navier-Stokes equation using the equation of state. Uh, but uh, for liquids, uh, when you're not considered on even gases and the sum conditions, you consider it to be an incompressible flow with that definitely reduces the complexity of the problem somewhat. It still remains pretty complex, right? And with density, uh, and for liquids, uh, incompressibility is a very valid assumption. Here, what I have drawn is the Van der Waals equation of state pressure versus specific volume. What is specific volume? Volume of uh, unit mass, or suppose a unit volume, uh, yeah. So it's like inverse density. And here you see that as you increase pressure, the density increases or the specific volume decreases. But this area is extremely sharp. You have to increase pressure by a lot to get a small change in the specific volume, right? And in for because of this thing, because the sharp increase, it is a reasonable assumption to consider uh, fluid flow to be compressible, incompressible for a large number of situations. Sometimes you do have to consider the compressible limit, right? So these various simpler cases is what we're going to spend our next four months on fluid mechanics. It's not just three partial differential equations, solve it with all the boundary conditions. As I said, it doesn't give, uh, give lead to understanding, but in case you are wondering that, okay, fluid flow, it's water running. I mean, you open the tap in the kitchen, there's some fluid flow. What can be interesting in that? Uh, let me let me illustrate to you that fluid flows can be extremely interesting. Okay, so I'll record that in the next part.